That was amazing. I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Um, so firstly, I think it's appropriate to thank you all for being here today. Um, we're going to engage in this, what I know is going to be a fantastic talk in, in a few minutes. I'd also like to welcome those who are not in the room. So this is being streamed live. So no profanity, people. Um, this is being streamed live. So I'd like to welcome everyone who's listening in. And uh, this is part of the Beyond the Baseline exhibition uh, events. And we're really, really grateful for uh, our panel members this evening. Um, it is an unprecedented lineup of expertise that if we were to put it together in a timeline, I'm probably looking at, what, maybe 200 years of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> a bit more than that, mate. As, oh, I was being kind. Um, uh, but a lot of wisdom on stage. Uh, <clears throat> as the talk progresses, it, I think it'd be wise to save up your questions for, for the end uh, and just make sure they're questions and not statements. Time thing. Um, moving on, I think the title of today's event or this evening's event is Reggae Revolutionaries. And I, you know, I, I just wanted to say something about that in terms of what today's talk, tonight's talk's about. Revolutionaries, revolutionaries are typically typically refer to individuals or groups or advocates of a particular or significant or often radical social, political or cultural change. In the context of music, it can refer to artists who challenge established norms, push the boundaries or pioneer new styles, thereby revolutionizing the music industry or culture. These revolutionaries often leave a lasting impact on their respective genres and influence the future generations of musicians. These are powerful individuals. And as James Baldwin once said, history is trapped in us and we are trapped in history. In this context, we are trapped in music and music is trapped in us. And I'd like to kick off this conversation by introducing, uh, I, I call him Sir Paul Gilroy, that's the status. <laughs> he wouldn't accept that acknowledgement, but Sir Paul, I'm gonna hand over to you to introduce uh, the panel and I'll get off the stage and shut up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Michael. Yes, you didn't. That's Michael Riley, everybody, just in case you didn't know that. Okay, well, welcome, revolutionaries. Um, here we are, people who have sculpted the sound, set the course for uh, black music in Britain for more than half a century, defined the sound of a generation, making a bass culture part of the identity of people during the toughest, the roughest times, times of exploitation, times of criminalization. And above all, I think, distinguishing the music that was being made here in this city, in this country, from the music that's coming in from the Caribbean, giving it a, a unique signature that's appreciated all across the planet. Um, it's difficult to know who to start with. Linton, our um, UK Black Poet Laureate. If I don't, <laughs> hope you don't mind being you know, described in that way. Maestro Dennis Pavel, High Priest of the Electric Church, Dub master, doctor of the low end, if I may call you that. <laughs> and John Capaye, uh, guitarist extraordinary, musical imagination with no borders, no boundaries, mixing styles, mixing, fusing, and moving forward. So thank you all. I thought we could begin really with, uh, we, we should play some music to get the juice flowing, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought we could begin by playing a, a, a tune that John produced and played on. You can tell us about it in a moment, John, from 1968. Um, for those of you who are too young or were not from here or online somewhere else in the world, will know that 1968 was a big year in this country. It was a year that Enoch Powell found the recipe that they've been baking every year and every election and every chance they get since then. 
um, a recipe for exclusion, for racism, for nationalism, and so on. And it's just always struck me as particularly extraordinary that that record, the Cats, Swan Lake, which moves into the charts, probably the first homemade, if I can say that, reggae record um, to chart in this country, comes out of that moment as well. So I'm going to play a little bit of it so people know what we're talking about. And then, John, maybe you could kick us off by talking about how it came to be and your um, vision for it and what it means to you now. John. Um, I was playing in a band called the, the Cats. Um, we were based in East London. And um, we played, well, just before reggae, rock steady, um, ska, soul music, mostly instrumentals. And um, my mother, who was working in uh, Woolworths, Bethnal Green Road, actually. Um, they had some stock taken, and they gave away all these old records to um, the workers, and she brought home this pile of records for me. And it was like kind of jazz stuff, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and some classical stuff. And I listened to all of these records, and I was... I love that, the theme tune for Tchaikovsky Swan Lake. You know, it's, it's a very beautiful melody. And... Um, I took this down the rehearsal room and uh, we worked up an arrangement and um, that's how this come about. Because um, I think at that time I was fascinated the way particularly ska music could um, mold with other kind of uh, other music, you know, jazz, you had a lot of jazz tunes, you know, done within a, a ska frame, uh, country music within reggae, you know. Um, and so I thought, well, why not classical? You know, it's a nice melody. You know, you, you had things like um, Guns and Navarone. You know, the theme music from that film was a big ska hit, right? And that's what I personally loved about reggae. It was very kind of moldable. And um, we recorded this track in um, a studio called um, Maximum Sound Studio in Old Kent Road, South London. And um, it was a big hit. You know, at that time with the original skinheads, not the mob that come after, you know. <laughs> and um, and as, this, as um, Paul said, it went into the, the, you know, into the lower reaches of the, the national charts uh, without any promotion or without any radio play, just by people hearing it in the clubs and that, you know. And um, Thank you, John. I mean, yeah. when did you, what did you think when you heard that tune? Then? My dad had a copy of that record, and I borrowed it from him. I haven't returned it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, in the, the places where my dad used to play his sound system, when that came on, the floor was always full, you know. Um, and so I wanted to do stuff like that, but I hadn't met John yet. But I, I think we were kind of on the same plane musically right. in trying to bring something different to what we were doing and to see if we can gain some audience reaction. Right, right. Linton, were you aware of that record when it came out? I was 16, <coughs> still at school. Mm -hmm. But I, I heard it, I can't remember, maybe a sound system was playing it or something. Um, and I liked it, I was aware of it, yes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of John, no. but I was aware of the tune, yeah. Well, of course, <coughs> a lot was changing in that moment, not just politically, but musically as well, because mm. ska is becoming something else, and reggae is beginning to emerge, and people are beginning to put a version side on the other side of the record, an instrumental cut and things like that. I mean, I was wondering, I know I don't like to, to leap too far ahead. Um, I want to ask you, John, how you felt about being a guitarist in the world of reggae as it opened up, because obviously there wasn't a lot of opportunities for guitar players in that style at that point. So in a way, you begin to create a role for the guitar in the music that's not actually happening anywhere else. And I think that's an important thing to say about your impact on other players. Um. 
Yeah, I mean, when I started playing, I, 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 I was basically very much into blues, jazz, uh, that kind of thing, you know? And um, so when I started playing on stage with a band, specifically reggae, you know, the, 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 most of the, you know, the guitar playing is limited to rhythm guitar, you know? Um, with a pick, picking, yeah, I don't think, picking guitar, it's like a, a picks along with a bass or in between the bass, you know? And uh, I found it pretty much restrictive, to be honest, you know? And um, when, especially when the Lovers Rock scene come along, I started playing um, a lot of kind of lead fills and that kind of thing, you know? Because it, it the music, I found, I would have to listen to the vocal and then find the space mm -hmm. between uh, the vocal because you don't, you don't want to mess with the vocal, right? And, um, and I kind of developed the style. And um, at that time, I was doing a lot of session work and I would kind of get booked for that particular kind of style, mm. uh, kind of lead guitar playing, you know? Mm. And um, So who were your influences then, did you say? When I was young. Um, oh, so many. Uh, obviously, people like George Benson, right. um, Phil Upchurch, right. those kind of guys. Right. Steve Cropper, right. you know, the soul guy. Um, Ernest Wranglin, of course, course, within, you know. Lynn Tate, you know, a lot of those guys in Jamaica who were developing that kind of, especially in Rocksteady, they were developing that kind of melodic picking style within the rhythm. And so I had a lot of influences. Um, even, you know, Carlos Santana, with, with, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of different influences, you know. Grant Green. Grant Green, yeah, uh, jazz guys. Yeah. And I, I spent a lot of time I spent six months in Germany in 1970 playing um, on the American bases. You know, that's, uh, they had a lot of these American military bases in Germany. And, um, or, you know, with the soldiers, we were being trained and then sent out to Vietnam. And they, um, I was playing with a, a band that had uh, two American singers who'd come back from, Amer uh, from Vietnam and um, playing soul music every night. Um, four sets, four, 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off, 45 minutes on, you know. And it was like a serious apprenticeship, right? And just playing soul music. And uh, I picked up a lot of my style, a lot of the licks and that from copying the records right. that I was, you know, having, you know, to play. And, um, and I, I infused a lot of that in, into reggae as well, you know. Um, you know, it, it wasn't just me. I mean, there's many guitar players who were doing that. Yeah, know? but nobody was doing it at the level you were doing it, if you don't mind my saying so. Um, I, yeah, I, I was probably the first guy over here who yeah. started doing, right. the, to doing that. Yeah. I mean, I can remember buying the... I, I want to just play another little fragment of something that you produced, and you can tell a story of that because I know that's the context in which you began to encounter Dennis. Um, but I just, just give us a little... I'm sorry, it's so violent to cut the music off, but I think we, we, we'll, otherwise okay. we'd just be listening to music all evening, which might, might be uh, a waste of our opportunity. So let, let me just play a little bit of this. It's beautiful. So that's the, the best part of the tune you haven't heard, which is the <laughs> solo. <laughs> the the solo. I, know, I know, I know. But now everybody's going to go and find that tune. It already, you know, it doesn't go for less than 200 pounds on Discogs, that record. It's a rare tune, so if you've got some in the basement, got them in the cellar, now's the time to send them to Japan, you know, it's the time to do that now. Um, okay, now, that record, I understand, I don't know who's playing on there with, with you, John, and presumably it's your arrangement and working with, with Ijaman. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, yes, it wasn't my, I mean, it was a group thing, I, I, right. can't, I can't remember, I think Giovanni was playing drums, I can't remember the rest of the guys. Right. But um, I'd known... Dennis Harris. That's a Dennis. It was for Dennis Harris, yeah, yeah for his um, dip label. Right. Although it was released on one of his subsidiaries. Lucky, yeah. But um, and a lot of people say to me, oh, I thought you was in, you, you know, you, you was involved with a lovers rock scene. You was more of that. But the truth is that most of the guys who played on the lovers rock stuff also played on, those on the on the root stuff. Mm. You know, there's no difference really. You come in, you and you hear the tune, and you get into the vibe. You know. Um, 
Yeah, and it's great tune. Mm. And that's the, Dennis Harris's, we, we have to thank him for connecting you two together, which is the beginning of the largest story. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, he said to me one night, he said, Ravel, I think you should play bass because your guitar playing is not up to it. <laughs> well, he used a much stronger term than that. <laughs> so I, I remember feeling a little bit offended because I thought, I thought I was an okay guitarist. You, you know? were, Dennis, you were. <laughs> and um, he said, and this was his exact words, he said, I'm going to bring a guitar player who will wipe the floor with you. <laughs> so I got my back up even more. I was like, yeah, bring him. <laughs> And then arrived this man, took his guitar out and started to play. I thought, damn. <laughs> Instantly, I knew that I was not, you know, anytime soon going to be as good as that. So I resigned from playing the guitar and started to play the bass. I thought, well, let's see if he can play bass like this. <laughs> but of course he could. <laughs> No, but Dennis, that's the best thing that ever happened to you because, you, you know, you, you, you just took to it and you was like the premier bass player. Well. But still are. I had yeah. to earn. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's the best thing that ever happened to you, you know? Yeah. Bass, fact, you're a natural bass player. In fact, John, when, um, after Linton's first album, I had botched a few guitar bits on there. And then when we were going to do the second album, I said, Linton, we need a guitar player. He went, what, one that's better than you? I'm going, <laughs> sadly, <laughs> there is one that exists. And um, so I brought John down to the session. And when Linton heard John playing, he leaned over and he went, he is better than you. <laughs> right. I told you. Uh, but the drum, the drum sound on that Ijerman track is the drum sound of that studio because that's the sound, the same drum kind of mix that you get in some of the other classic Lovers Rock tunes. Did you do that at Gooseberry? Uh, um, no, that was down by... Um, Dip. Really, down by Dip, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. well, we had a friend who, who was the drummer of a group called... Um, what, was, what was Steve's group called? Black is black, I want my... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Huh? The equals. No, no, not the equals. Oh, black is black. It, it was... An English pop group. An English pop, pop group, group. Yeah. Right, that's right. That's yeah, right. I can't that's remember. Right. Black is Black was their number one record. Yeah, I can't remember. And who? No. No, no, it's before this. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving swiftly along. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'll remember before the evening. I mean, I, 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 I think I, I, I was one of many people who bought I'm In Love With The Dreadlocks when it came out, but I used to get a big reaction playing um, the other side of it, the, the dub side of it. And I always thought for years that was Dennis playing the bass until I asked him and he said it was you so doing it. So you but Dennis played. mixed it. Dennis mixed it. Dennis mixed it, yeah. yeah. So can I just play a little bit of that? Because the reason I want to play it is because it seemed to me to be the beginning of you creating a dub sound that was not like a Jamaican dub sound at mm. all. Can, we? Okay. Can, can I just say that of course. I had a pseudonym then yeah. for, for productions. My pseudonym was Brownie T because everybody would spell my name wrong on records, you know? K-P-I-A-Y, they would spell it wrong, and it caused problems with my um, royalties and so forth. So I changed my name to Brownie T for productions, right? Mm. And then now it causes me problems. <laughs> to get, it causes me problems, you know? So, yeah. So, but this is actually mixed by Dennis. Sorry, let's, the rest, let's all hear what you were saying to each other. I'll just remember the name of the group, Los Bravos. Ah, oh, that's it, yeah. Yeah, they were a Spanish group, weren't they? Yeah. Well, Steve was very much he English. Was English. <laughs> he was the drummer and the singer. It was him that sang that Black is Black. Right. And then he got fed up with sitting at the back of the band. So he decided to go into electrical engineering. Hmm. And the record machine that we were using to, to record all these songs was made by him. It was supposed to be an eight track, but only seven of them were, but that was good enough for us. <laughs> I mean, were you aware of how innovative what you were doing was at the time you were doing it? Or did that only come later? I certainly tried to make it um, sound different and um, mm. like our own kind of 
London thing, you know, uh, because we were always being ridiculed for trying to sound like the Jamaican sound. And I was always ready to point out, yes, that's the name of the giant that we're standing on his shoulders, right, the Jamaican sound, but we're actually creating our own thing, you know, by listening to, dare I say, the Beatles, the Who, you know, um, Jimi Hendrix, all stuff that we were getting here in, in the UK, and as well, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett and all that. And then I, I found we took little bits out of their styles to put into our own style to what we were creating. Right. And of course, John <clears throat> wrote that, the song. Yeah. And um, I always found it, you know, extraordinary that uh, a big man like John could write love lyrics for these teenage girls. Mm -hmm. You know. um, we had a teenage daughter himself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, is, that, that, is that Karen Wheeler singing the lead on, though, or is that Kofi or who? Um, this is, um, Pauline. No, no, Pauline, yes. Yeah. She, uh, she was only 14 at the time. Right. They were very young, school kids. And, um, so, so what's the story of them arriving in the studio, or arriving with Dennis, or how did that well, come I was, about? As I said, I was doing a lot of work for Dennis Harris, who owned Dick Records, and... He one day said, look, I'm having some talent contests. And I, I, you know, I found these young girls. Do you have any songs for them? Would you like to produce them? And I said, yeah, sure, you know, let, let, let me hear them. So they, I met them in the studio. And um, I went home and wrote, I'm in love with dreadlocks, right? And um, I, because I wanted something that was catchy. There was a tune at the time that was big at the time called Curly Locks. Right? Miles, yeah. This is a tune about um, a, a, a guy singing and, and his girlfriend's parents didn't want him to, you know, associate with him. So I re kind of reverse, I'm in love with dreadlocks. And um, they come in and, and they, they sung it and it was, uh, it was the first tune on, on the Lover's Rock label, the original Lover's Rock label. And it was a big hit. And, big uh, pick, John. As I say, um, Pauline, who sang it, was only 14. Yeah. The thing was, right, that um, in the West Indian community, and uh, Coffee pointed this out to me the other day, the importance of that song. She said, if you were a young girl bringing home a boyfriend for the first time, he could be English, Indian, Chinese, anything, but not a dreadlocks, <laughs> right? Uh, because um, there was a stigma that dreadlocks people were um, just a bunch of ganja smokers. And um, their uh, thought or their, their thoughts on theology, I mean, about Selassie being God, didn't bide well with a lot of West Indian parents, you know. And they thought, I think, that um, if their daughter brought home such a person, she would be on the way out, you know, into kind of, <laughs> in, in her thinking and, you know, and not wanting to comb her hair. <laughs> yeah, sounds funny now, it wasn't so funny. <laughs> <laughs> At the time. In fact, when, when I managed to grow a few scrags, my dad wouldn't speak to me. <laughs> it's like, we, we get that style from. <laughs> And they're like, cha, which cha? I from Barbados, so you can't come here with this cha business. <laughs> and that's Jamaican here, you think you're talking to your friends on the street? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, well, I want to play one more record from that era because it's actually about, in, in a way, it's an important one. But Janice mentioned earlier, and John too. The idea that we, you know, when we write the history, we tend to separate things out and saying, well, that's lovers, and that's roots, and that's for women, and that's for men. And actually, those lines are very blurry. And this is a very, it's a very political record, Black Pride. I mean, before we listen to it, John, do you want to talk about the circumstances of, it, of its production, its coming alive? Um, yeah. Uh, well, Brown Sugar were three young girls, okay? And that they, they were quite um, socially... Um, politically aware, even though they were very young. And Karen, 
um, who, who sung the vocal on this, said to me, um, um, I don't want to always sing love, love records. You know, I'd like to see, sing something that's meaningful. And, um, but, and they wasn't writing at the time, so I thought, right, here we go. And um, <clears throat> I come up with, with this record because it was, it was the era, you know, the, the, the time when we was all kind of saying, we're black and proud, you know? I grew up, you know, in the 60s listening to James Brown saying we're black and proud. Um, Curtis Mayfield, a lot of these, you know, people that had an Im effect on me, you know? And I just, you know, because I was wondering, you know, going through that thing, being mixed race as well. I was going through this thing of um, who am I? What am I? And going for that very anti-English stage as well, because, you know, you grow up. The worst thing people can say to you is, go back to your own country, effort back to your own country, right? And that kind of causes this real problem, you know? And um, I've got to tell you, in the 1966 World Cup final, right? Mm. England v Germany, I desperately wanted England to lose. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's how, that's how you know, that's what the, the kind of growing up in Britain at that time made me feel. And I was really heartbroken, you know, when England won it. But, um, <laughs> but I, I got over that. Yeah, I was and um, anyway, back to this. It was, it was something that I felt would be good for them. Because, you know, they, as I said, they were very conscious. And um, it was something that I believed in as well. Yeah. And, um, Are you on this one, Dennis? Or did you, no. You didn't do anything on here? Because what happened was in the studio, John would work a kind of nine to five. And then I would work a kind of five till nine next morning. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we shared the engineering, <coughs> the production, and uh, uh, dip. Um, actually only wanted us two in the studio. He, he'd go, right, you two are in charge. You do your sessions, you do your sessions, and that's it. And um, it's funny that people called him dip because... Um, I think it was a, a kind of dyslexia because his name was Dennis LaSalle's Harris, right? And his production company was called DL Productions. But somehow the community looked at DL Productions, you know, DL being our dip, you know? So the L became an I. <laughs> okay. and, he, and he loved it. He thought, yeah, they don't really know who I am. <laughs> you know, and, uh, to this now then. <laughs> so, do, did you play all the instruments then on that, then, John? Um, yeah, apart from the drums. Mm. I think I, I, I went in with the drummer. Leroy Green. Leroy Green, and, um, and we put... No, and keyboard player. Uh, Fish. Fish, a keyboard player. His real name was Noel Salmon. Salmon. So he, we call just call him Fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the three of us put that down, right? Right. And then I put the, uh, the. I mean, it's a very basic track, because yeah. um, as I said, we only had seven tracks. I mean, a couple, couple, two tracks for the vocals, and that was it, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and the synthesizer thing, you know. Yeah. Which yeah. I stole from him. <laughs> I stole. When I produced Errol Dunkley, Little Way Different, I was like, yeah. Thanks, John. That. <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 kind of synthesizer? I thought it sounded like I thought it was a Mellotron. I didn't know what it was. Nah, I don't know what symbol one was it. One of them early ones, Very early. Uh, monophonic ones, you know. Yeah. Wasn't polyphonic. Okay. Well, that's a conscious record, right? Oh, so we're yeah. moving now towards consciousness. And so, how did you meet these two characters, Linton, and how did they enter your world of music making? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I, I never had any idea that I could make music until I began to write verse. Jamaican verse, poetry. And um, I, I got inspired by the reggae DJs like um, I Roy and U Roy and Prince Jasbro and others. Big Youth. Big Youth, yeah, Big Youth was one of my favorites. And uh, I was writing this Jamaican verse and I used to um, recite it with some Rasta drummers, some guys I went to school with who called themselves Rasta Love. And um, uh, I was, you know, I was a serious r student of reggae music. I mean, uh, mm. 
when I bought a record, I wanted to know um, who who the drummer was, who the bass player was. I, I studied it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, cut a long story short, it sudden it, it occurred to me that if I want, I had a book published, um, Dread Beat and Blood in 1975. And I thought, well, if I want to reach a wider audience, um, if I put my poetry to reggae music, maybe, you know, I, you know, I could win over a bigger audience. And um, I got together with um, a school friend called Vivian Weathers, who was a musician, a songwriter, played a bit of guitar, a bit of bass, a bit of everything, really. And um, it so happened that when I was at university, towards the end of my, my um, three years, a guy named John Varnum, um, who was a teacher at Santley School in Brixton, contacted me and said, can I write some adverts, some copy for, for Virgin Records because they just started putting out reggae music, and which I did. I you know, wrote copy and uh, did the radio ads, voiced the radio ads as well. And I said to him, when I recite my poetry, People say it sounds like music, you know. Why don't you, you know, you guys give me a chance to make a record? And um, I got together with Vivian Weathers um, and a guy named Winston Kerniff, who died some years ago, who played drums. And um, we made a demo. And um, Richard Branson, who was the the guy who was running um, Virgin Records at the time heard it and said, um, they'll give me a try, you know. They gave me 200 pounds and I went to a studio in Wimbledon. It was a four track studio. And so Vivian said to me, well, if you're gonna make a record, if you're serious about making a record, you have to have Dennis Bovell as the engineer. So I knew um, Dennis, I, I'd known of Dennis because Dennis was the selector for a sound system that I used to listen to called Sufferer. And they used to play in the Metro Youth Club in Ladbroke Grove. And um, he was the resident um, in, uh, recording engineer at Gooseberry's studio in... Um, Chinatown. What, Chinatown, yeah. What was the name of this? Gerard Street. Gerard Street. Yeah. Gerard Street in, in Chinatown. So... Through Vivian, I got to link up with them, with Dennis. Cut a, um, I'd met him before that. I said, I'd met him at, um, at um, a club. Four Aces. Uh, uh, Four Aces Club. I went to interview them because at the time I was also doing freelance journalism. Yeah. And I was doing little interviews for the BBC World Service. So I interviewed his band, Matumbi at the time, and I said, I'm gonna make a record one day, and when I do, I want you to be the sound engineer. And he said, come when you're ready. <laughs> Three years later, he turned up. <laughs> yeah, and um, that's how, you know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know my way around the studio. I didn't know anything, anything. Well, but I was a fast learner, and I learned a lot from Dennis. We did Dread Beat and Blood and got away with it. It was voted Reggae Album of the Year in one of those newspapers. And, and next thing I know, um, I had a career. I was beginning a career as a recording artist. So um, when it came to, to, to the second album now, Forces of Victory, because Chris Blackwell had heard Dread Beat and Blood and said he wanted me on Island, Island Records. He sent a guy named Dennis Morris oh, yeah. to get me. Um, famous photographer. Richard Branson had offered me a deal, eight albums or something, and I just, just didn't, I mean, I was just trying a thing, you know, <laughs> and it seemed to work. Anyway, when we, the time came to make Forces of Victory, um, Dennis brought in Jaboni from his band Matumbi to play drums, um, as well as Winston Kerniff, and um, I said, you're not gonna play, are you, are you, you know, can you play guitar? He says, me have a wicked guitar player. <laughs> and uh, that was John Kapai. Mm. 
And when I said, when I heard John, you know, I thought, wow, this guy is extraordinary. Well, he played a solo um, on reality poem, mm. which was out of this world. Completely. Out of this world. I'd never heard a guitar solo like that. But let's listen track. to that, and then we'll talk about the dub band and how that came. Have they got it here? Yeah, I've got the next. Oh, <laughs> it's on my list. Be, be careful. Now, <coughs> yeah, but I it mean, takes a while before you say, before you, go, you get into the solo. It yeah. comes in about two minutes and twenty. Do you think you can oh. handle that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, just check it. Right. I don't know if I can handle it in two minutes of myself. <laughs> well, hey. I remember once sitting on an aeroplane, three of us in a row. It was John. And it was David Gilmour and me. And me bending Gilmour's air about how good a guitarist John was. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, I'm going to go and listen to the record. <laughs> I hope you did, Gil. Right. So, so from the studio project, how did the dub band as a touring outfit, a touring operation come about? Well, I'd like to say, Linton came one day and said, He'd been touring the whole of Europe with a tape recorder. <laughs> and it, when we finished the recordings, we used to make um, Instrumental. voice instrumentals so that he could go out and perform. Mm. And um, one day he said, I can't do this anymore in front of 20,000 people. <laughs> so I said, well, let's put a band together. Mm. So the dub band was born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did that change? the way that you worked, and how did that change the music? Did it change your writing as well? Well, you know, two things happened. In 1978, I think it was, I had a bad experience at the Rainbow. I was opening for Johnny Rotten's band, um, Public Image Limited, and, you know, I was reciting my poetry over this pre-recorded music. And whoever was doing the sound, they, they didn't cue up the tape properly. So it started about four bars in. And I didn't know where I was with, on the track. And I was talking on that first, the first track out of sync with the music. You know, so embarrassing. By the second track, I'd recovered because I knew where I was. The same thing happened again in 1979 at the Palace in Paris. I was opening for a film which Chris Blackwell had produced called Rockers. Yeah. I, was the, I was the opening act and then they were gonna show the film. Same thing happened, they started the tape. They didn't cue up the tape properly. Mm. And I was horrified because I didn't know where I was again. And Chris Blackwell was sitting, sitting in the audience. You know, He's the one who had signed me to his record label. Anyway, we, we recovered, and it was, a, it was all right. And then we were touring all over Europe, Scandinavia, France, Germany, Italy, and so on, with this backing tape. And, and three of my friends, Vivian Weathers, who played the bass, Winston Kerniff, who played the drums, but they weren't playing anything. They were just skanking on stage right. while I was reciting the, the poems to the pre-recorded music. The people used to come up to me afterwards and said, ah, oh, that was a great show, Linton, fantastic. But where was the band? Where was the band? So I think Dennis had um, parted company with Matumbi at the time. Yeah. And um, he didn't have anything doing. I mean, he has so much experience back in musicians. I mean, Matumbi used to back all the reggae artists coming up from Jamaica to perform. Yeah. Alton Ellis, Iroy, I mean, Johnny Clark. Johnny Clark. Ken Booth. Ken Booth, you Matt know. Kelly. There you go. So um, he'd left Matumbi and, and formed this new band. And um, we got together. And um, the first gig we did, we, we, um, we played at the, um, where is that place in um, Aldwych? The Lyceum. The Lyceum. We played the Lyceum with a band from Jamaica called... Culture. No, No, Chalice. it wasn't called Chalice. 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 And the Chalice blew us away. <laughs> <coughs> we came on second. 
We came up, they were the opening act, and they blew us away. They hogged I mean, the stage, man. What do you mean that? <laughs> they, they wouldn't come off. <laughs> <laughs> and the sound was, the onstage sound was terrible. I couldn't hear myself. I had to struggle to keep in, in time with the music, you know. Next thing I knew, Robin Denslow oh, yeah. writes me this fabulous review in one of the big newspapers. And um, the rest is history. Yeah, well, actually, we, the dub band, were on tour in Scandinavia, in Sweden. And we had an agent who also represented Linton, Kenneth Overson. And he said, Linton's coming to do some poetry. Why don't you lot do a gig with Linton? And that was actually the first time we went on stage together. We were in Sweden. Was it? Yeah. Before it was um, here? No, we, 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 we came back and did something here in the Lyceum. Was it? But the first time we did a gig together was in um, Lund. Right. Are you in sure? Southern, yeah. No, his Sweden. memory is very His good. memory is better than mine. Uh. And then I thought I said, <coughs> yeah, this can work, you know. <laughs> but I only did that for three years because, as I said, I didn't set out to become a musician, right. uh, a, a reggae artist or a reggae entity, but I was making some money mm -hmm. and I was able to prov provide a, a roof over the, the head of my family, mm -hmm. buy a house and so on, and I was earning some money. Mm -hmm. And I did it for about three years. And then in 1988, I retired. Um, Largely because, um, as I said, I, did, I felt a bit uncomfortable with it at times, and I was getting a lot of hassle mm. from some of my comrades because I was a political activist um, involved in the Race Today Collective, Black Parents <laughs> Movement, creation. And, and, and Creation for Liberation, and so on. And um, I think Darkos wanted me to come and work for him in his television mm. uh, program called The Bandung File as a researcher, presenter. And um, so I gave up all, earning all that nice money to go and work for a pittance <laughs> in television of Channel 4 on the Bandung File. And after three years, I got, fed up of, I got fed up of that. I wasn't earning any money. And um, I was getting a bit pissed off with Darkus as well, to be honest. And, um, then I saw Dennis somewhere the other, and he said to me, I was complaining to him, he says, let's go back on the road, man. Yeah. So by 1988, I was back on the road again with Dennis, and then, you know. The rest is history. The rest is history. From Senegal to Brazil. Yeah, we played all over the world. Japan. Japan. Australia. Um, yeah, all over. Yeah. But, I mean, that's actually important, because one of the things that's hard to do, <coughs> I wonder what you think about this, John, is to earn a living as a working reggae musician. And you talked about going in the Four Aces mm. earlier on. My memory of going in that place was that there was no interest in live music at all. No, not at all. No. In fact... People wanted the records. They didn't want to have a live band. Yep. And so when Matumbi had a, a gig there, and we managed to finish the show without being booed off, right? <laughs> Because that was the thing, you got on there, you, you're waiting for people to boo you off. It was like the 101, right? Or the 19, what's that club where people used to boo, boo people? And um, nobody clapped. But most importantly, nobody booed. Victory. Mm. <laughs> Back in those days, British reggae bands, they were the opening act for the sound system. Yeah. The sound system was the star of the show. Absolutely. That's why I had to straddle both lanes. <laughs> if, I could, if I couldn't start a show as a group, I'd start it as a sound system. But you could tour all over the world and find an eager audience of people who wanted to hear what you were doing and could appreciate the innovative things that were coming out of this particular environment. So that's, that's you know, I mean, I think... Well, a lot of Jamaican musicians say something similar too, that they, their audiences for certain periods are in the world, they're not in Jamaica. No one mm. wants, wants to hear classic roots. But you know, for me, um, I took myself very seriously, perhaps a little bit too serious. I mean, 
he was a laugh a minute. He never took, he never took, Dennis never took anything serious apart from his playing and his engineering. Everything else was a laugh, you know. But I felt, you know, I was touring Germany, France, all these places, um, Scandinavia. I was writing about the black experience in Britain. So I, I, I was conscious of the fact that I wasn't just there as me as an artist entertaining people. I was representing my community. Mm -hmm. And I had to carry myself in a particular kind of way with a certain amount of dignity and so on. And um, most of the guys in the bands didn't really understand that. But um, I think John did, because he was always very well behaved. <laughs> John, it's been a pleasure. John, let me say this to you publicly. It's been a pleasure working with you. You're the, you're the best musician I've ever worked with. Uh, Don't take my uh, uh, <laughs> can, I, can, can I return the compliment? It was fantastic working with you, you know? And uh, apart from the wonderful music, you gave me an opportunity to see the world. You know, from Iceland to Brazil to Japan, all over, all over Africa, you know? And um, I thank you for that, Vinton. You know? Thank you. Well. Well, Dennis, you want to add something he before we open my it up? dad wrong. Because upon hearing that I intended to become a professional musician, he was pissed off. He was like, you're never going to eat a decent meal in a decent <laughs> restaurant. Because <laughs> all the musicians I know are broke. And I went, you tell that to Paul McCartney or Stevie Wonder or Otis Redding or, you know, any one of them, that music is not a viable career. Yeah, but your dad, your dad was a classically trained musician, wasn't he? Unfortunately for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe this is a moment to start to open this up for questions from our audience this evening and questions also um, from our audiences um, online. Now, who, has anyone got a question they would like to ask this esteemed cast here up on the stage? Does, can you wait for the microphone? Because I think because they're taping, they probably wouldn't be able to hear your voice. Sorry about that. One, two, one, two. You said you spoke to many, you played to many people over the world, Sweden, etc. And you said you were representing England from the black experience. Do you think that helped in any way to people to understand? Because we've seen influxes from Europe of immigration. Do you think that helped them to understand why you, me, my family are here? That they understand why we're here? Well, I, I don't think I helped them to understand that. I think they understood themselves. What I, I think I helped them to understand was that they could organize themselves and fight for racial equality and social justice. Mm. That's, what we do. That's what we were doing. I remember you saying uh, um, uh, in one of our previous conversations about the impact of going to Poland to play at the time of the shipyards in Dansk, you know, yes. with the dub band. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds to me as though we need to acknowledge that there's a two-way process there of learning and exchanging and communicating truths and rights and justice and the struggle for different freedoms. I don't know if that made a big impression on yeah, you. Yeah, well, you know, to go, get back to the gentleman's question, politically, the black population in Britain were at least 20 years or more politically advanced than black populations in places like France and and, and Germany and Scandinavia and all these places. We were way ahead of them, politically. Do you think the black population of England, in conjunction with the white population, because there are white people here who listen to your music, that we, through your music, found a solution to a problem? How do we all get along? How do we all work? 
Sorry, I didn't understand the last part of the question. Did you? Well, if, if I got it, it's, it's the suggestion, I think, that there's, in the way the music is used and circulates, um, that people devise um, a way of getting along with one another that points to a different way. Well, of course, music is a great leveler. Music is the only language that, that's universally understood. And I felt I was very privileged um, in able, being able to communicate to non-black audiences, to white audiences, what black people were experiencing in this country. Mm. Most, the, the biggest audiences I ever had mm. with, with, um, with music were white audiences. When I did poetry readings, that was a different thing because when I started reciting poetry, it was community centers, um, political rallies, demonstrations, and so on and so forth. Once I began to make records, I was going, I was doing the university circuit mm. and playing in small clubs up and down the country. Um, and I came on the scene at the time of punk, punk yeah. and I was opening for a lot of punk bands. Well, not a lot, a few of the punk bands. Susie. Um, Susie and the Banshees, um, Public Image Limited, and so on and so forth. But it was important um, for me um, to be able to say, um, you know, this is this is this is what we are experiencing. Mm. Uh, th these are our experiences, and this is how we this is what we're doing to fight back. Um, yeah. Okay. There's lots of people who want to get in. Maybe we can take a couple of questions together. If you could take the people who are closest to one another here on the right hand side, and then we'll come over here in a minute. This right, it's coming to you. Sorry, I can't see where the microphone is. Just a question for Linton. When you wrote England is a Bitch, mm -hmm. did you get a lot of backlash, or what was the worst backlash here, and were you allowed to perform that abroad? Um, I didn't get any backlash here. Um, I mean, I was, that poem is really about the experiences of my parents' generation um, when they came to England. Uh, I didn't get any ba um, backlash apart from one time. Um, I, I, I was doing this gig at the Ritzy in Brixton, and um, somebody took offense. Uh, um, some feminist took offense. Um, <laughs> the use of the term bitch. Um, and of course, I, I, I had to explain that, you know, there's something called metaphor in poetry, and that in any event, one had poetic license. <clears throat> but no, and I'm not proud to say this, but um, there was a musician's union strike. I was a member of the union. There was a musician's union strike. And um, there's a program, music program, called the Old Grey Whistle Test. And uh, they invited me to go on. And um, that's what I recite without, without the band, because I was used to reciting it without the band. All of my, po all, all of my records, most of my records, were, had a life as poems, yeah. which I used to recite yeah. before I recorded them with Dennis. Um, and I did England is a Bitch. And I've, I've received so many plaudits for that over the years. People said, man, you went on England, English television and said, England is a bitch. Wow. <laughs> but people couldn't believe it, you know. Well, yeah. Earlier on, I reminded Linton um, of a gig we did in Germany, in a place called Stuttgart, a club called the Longhorn. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I remember the Longhorn. Someone in the audience <clears throat> shouts out, Linton. He goes, yeah. He goes, England is a bitch. <laughs> and Linton goes, I know. <laughs> what about Germany? <laughs> and there was that, you could hear a pin drop, it was silence. <laughs> okay. Can you send, pass the mic along, please? Uh, sorry, this is one for Dennis. Could you just. Uh, settle an argument I have with my friend Gordon. Were you the first guy to record a Japanese group in reggae, and have you recorded many 
people from other countries? Well, I don't know about the first, but I certainly recorded quite a lot of Japanese artists and did a lot of stuff in Japan um, up until just before lockdown. I haven't been back there since, but um, I used to go there every year. I mean, the first time I went there was with Linton in 1983. That was our first Tokyo gig. Remember we played this? When we got stranded. No, you and I didn't, but John and the rest of the band did. <laughs> when we, we, we went, we, we got a flight to Moscow. We were on Aeroflot. Yeah, we got a flight to Moscow, and um, when, when, when we landed in the middle of nowhere, and I said to the stewardess, um, could you tell us what's happening? Um, where are we? Um, what's going on? And she said, I'm awfully sorry, but I don't speak English. <laughs> and we had to come home via Zurich. That's right. And the rest of the band was left in Tokyo. For, for 10 days. Yeah, yeah. We <coughs> a few gigs out there, you know, so we managed to survive. So all the people that were going, oh, I'd like to stay here, man, their wish came true. <laughs> Well, didn't Richard Sakamoto come and seek you out because he wanted to yes. use your studio at one point? Sakamoto um, had heard of my dub thing and uh, Don Letts went to Japan with The Clash. And so Sakamoto said to him, you know Dennis Boverley? Yeah, he goes, can I have his telephone number because I want to, you know, work with him. And Don came back and said, oh, I've been asked for your telephone number by some Japanese musician called Ruti Sakamoto. I said, and what did you do? He said, I gave it to him. <laughs> and I went, oh, good, well done. <laughs> because I was a fan of Sakamoto's group, um, Yellow Magic. So to be asked by the Don of Yellow Magic to be included in one of his, you know, mm. productions was like, hmm. And you've worked a lot with musicians in Africa, and particularly with Alpha Blondie, haven't you? Alpha Blondie. In fact, we just finished Alpha Blondie's next album, and uh, we worked with Capleton. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Alpha Blondie and Capleton. Look out for that tune. Wow. <laughs> okay. Gosh, three of you. Let's take the three questions together this time, and then we'll see if there's anyone coming um, through on the online track. Uh, first off, thank you to each of you um, for all of your respective works and, and for this conversation. It's been wonderful. Um, I have a question about Linton, specifically one of your lyrics, um, a song called Fight Them Back, where the hook is fascist on the attack. We're going to fight them back. Uh, can you speak to the rise of and the resistance to different fascisms that we're seeing today, currently, from Occupy Palestine to um, uh, India uh, to Hungary to uh, obviously in America there was almost a coup, etc. Yeah, that's joking. Question. I can't go into all of that. <laughs> one, 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 one. Can you We're going to take these three. Okay, I, um, I just wanted to ask. Uh, how sound has liberated you over the years. I'm a musician and a poet as well, and I found music through language, and I think there was an evolution, not to get into me, but the, en the interesting thing is how sound changes what language does and how language changes what sound can do. And I'm wondering how your evolution and experience of sound has changed over the years and what silence is to you as well. As a question for you, Dennis. Oh. And now you, Silence yeah. is golden. Hang on. Yeah, go on. Okay, my, my question's quite different. I'm, I'm curious to know how you felt about some of the other bands that, that was roughly similar era, Black Slate, as word. Was there much mixing? Did you play together? Um, I know with sound systems, there's a big thing about area and whether that was relevant with bands and, you know... That's my, that's my question. Okay. Which, you, which ones did you I rate? Select anything from those well, questions you would like. The, like. the thing about bands being in competition with each other, we tried to um, get rid of that because I personally um, worked with musicians from all different bands. Like, Jabani was from Undivided. Um, Drummy Zeb was from Aswad, you know. Um, other musicians that used to come down to the studio and jam along with us were 
proof that we weren't really in competition with each other, but we were actually there and supporting each other. Well, you a community, a part yeah. of a community yeah. of musicians. Yeah. You produced the Trevor Hartley track with Ras Elroy from Black Slate playing the background. That's right. That. Yeah. So there must be many examples like that. And in that. fact, Drummy Zeb from Aswad played on a lot of Linton stuff right. too. Okay. Yeah, you didn't know. Drummy Zed. Drummy Zed played on um, Making History. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> and, and Richie Stevens as well. Richie Stevens, I remember. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, Drummy Zed. Drummy. Yeah, and we, when we did a production with uh, Mikey Smith, we got dro oh, Drummy yes. Zed. Drum well, that's another point of collaboration. I wondered if you. I don't want to avoid the question about um, fight, fight them back. Okay, fine. Back. Um, fight them back. I was part of the. Um, that was a way of um, of saying that um, you know we would meet fire with fire. Um, it was a, um, a poem of resistance, a song of resistance, and over the years we've been conscious throughout from the eighties onwards of the resurgence of fascism throughout Europe mm -hmm. to the point where, um, you know, in Germany and in France and, and other parts of Europe, the fascists have become part of mainstream politics, which I find very frightening. Yeah. And I think that people still need to be um, alert and vigilant against this resurgence in this country. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the reason why it didn't, you know, um, they didn't have the same amount of success in this country is because the Tory party have always sort of catered to a certain section of that crowd. Yeah. Well, that's part of the reason. But the other part of the reason is because what you all did, and many others, to change the culture and give it a certain layer. It's like, like them, but. Yeah, I mean, that, that would, that's a factor too, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, um, music is, well, music is not so much nowadays, but when I was younger, music was, I woke up with music and went to bed with music. And I've always been, um, I've always felt that there was a relationship between language and music, that there was music in language. And that, well, language we all understand, uh, music we all understand is a language in itself a universal language. And my aesthetics, if to use a posh word, um, is based on this, this idea of the musicality of language mm -hmm. and, and, and the language of music. Well, that's really a wonderful thing for you to share with us this evening. But I want to, it makes me want to ask you a question. That when you produced the music to go with the poems that you recorded with the band, was that the same music as the music you already had in your head when you wrote that? I, I never had any music in my head apart from the bass line. Right. All I had in my head was the bass line and props, you know, whether it's going to be a one drop or a four four, Steppers. a stepper's beat or whatever. Um, and each musician, or the, the, some of the better musicians that I worked with, were able to bring their own creativity right, to bear upon what we were doing. You know, people like John. I mean, John played the sweetest, um, um, not rhythm guitar, um, picking guitar. I mean, I don't, I don't hear, maybe Lynn Tate is the only person who could, can pick as sweet as you, John. Great Lynn Tate. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Great Lynn Tate from Jamaica. Um, so each, each, each musician brought their own um, creativity to bear on the recordings. And then I would do the arrangements in conjunction with Dennis, because right. Dennis has the greatest ear in the business. I told him years ago to get his ears insured. <laughs> <laughs> He's planning to chop them up. <laughs> because he might not have a great singing voice, <laughs> but if, you, if you're a singer and you come into a studio, if you're just a little bit sharp, he'll hear it. And if you're just a little bit flat, he'll hear it. You know. well, that's what music's about. Except now we're in the era of auto-tune, so we don't have to worry about those yeah. things anymore. Nowadays, we could just go, all right, bye, and then put him in a machine and tune him up. Tune <laughs> up. Uh. Right. 
There were a couple more hands. Is there any... Uh, the back there, then. Is there anything coming through on the... From the no one on this of... side is asking any question. The yeah. questions are all coming from that side. Why is that? There's more people over there. Right. Hello. Hello. Let, Hello. Can these... you hear me now? <coughs> there we go. Let's take these. Hiya. Yeah. Um, we have a question from online, and it kind of picks up something you mentioned earlier about Poland. So this is from Bartosz. And they say, your work has inspired countless people in my mother country of Poland, including Polish reggae musicians back in the 1980s and 90s. Who, which artists on the international scene inspire and interest you? Who, who is that for me? Is that for me? Well, I think well, it's for you and Everyone. any of you, actually. Well, you guys can go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let John take this. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. The question is, <laughs> have you been inspired by reggae musicians or musicians in other parts of the world who have been inspired or in dialogue with the things you've created and offered them as a touring band or as uh, through the recordings you've made? Um, other reggae musicians from... Yeah, yeah I mean, from the question that mentioned reggae musicians in Poland, you know, and yeah, I, we know that... I, to be honest, I don't... I mean, I played in Poland, but I don't really know the, 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 the reggae Polish scene. reggae scene. Right. But... Well, we've toured wherever we've gone. We have been amazed at some of the, the, the bands, some of the reggae bands. You know, Sweden, I've seen some incredible reggae bands there. Yeah. You know? Africa, um, yeah. even Iceland. You know, yeah. Brazil. It's, um, it's, it's, it's it, you know, reggae is truly an international music. You know, whereas one time, a lot of these countries would maybe play jazz or, or whatever. Now they all play reggae. You know, and they play it very well. Um, I wouldn't say I've been influenced by it, but I've been very impressed by some of the, the reggae bands we've seen, you know? Well, we went to Gdansk in 1988. I did uh, this, this anti-apartheid gig organized by Solidarity. That was the union, trade union movement led by Lech... Lech Walesa. How do you say his name? Walesa. Okay. And um, <laughs> I was... Uh, uh, we were just one of many, of several bands. Um, yeah. Twinkle Brothers. Twinkle Brothers were there. Um, Bob Andy was there. Benjamin. Benjamin Zephaniah was there. Brinsley. Uh, yeah, Brinsley Ford. Brinsley Ford from, from Aswad was there. It was bloody cold. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could scrape in the bus. You could scrape the ice off the windows inside the bus. It was freezing yeah. cold. But the thing that astonished me was... Um, the audience were so much into reggae music. Yeah. I mean, and there were so many red, gold, and green um, woolen hats, people wearing red, gold, and green. I thought, and this the is Poland? The fragrance was in the air. That's the first thing I noticed. I went, oh, it smells uh, particularly <laughs> reggae in here. <laughs> We've got another question at the back there. There's two more. Right, go on, please. I have a question. Uh, thank you so much for the enriching conversation. One of the things that we've been exploring in Beyond the Baseline is thinking about the specificity of the British space. And so, of course, all of you have been making music, you know, creating within the space of Britain. So one of the questions that I have is, is there anything that's specific about the music, the creations that you've been making in Britain? How does it differ from other places? I'm thinking about somewhere like Jamaica. Um, what is the difference? What's the specificity around the, the, the creativity in the space of Britain? Our experiences. Absolutely. I second that. Do you want to elaborate on that? <laughs> I could, but I don't know if we've got time. <laughs> oh, we do. Yeah, look, there's the clock ticking there. Well, our experiences is like, um, for instance, uh, you've gone down the road and you've come face to face with old Bill. And uh, he says something to you and in response, you go, sorry, mate. And he goes, I'm not your mate. Now, that's an experience that has to be learned that when you speak to them people, right, you don't try and say we're all the same because you're not. They're there and you're there, okay? Um, it's experiences like that that um, we draw upon 
when we're making music. I'm sure when Linton's uh, writing his poetry and when he says, them kick him in him seed and it started to bleed, I think, mate, I've seen that done. <laughs> you know, um, my own, my eldest son decided that he was going to become a policeman. I was horrified. I was like, what? You're going to become a copper? And he went, yeah, you and Linton are always saying there's something wrong. I'm going to do something from inside. I had to say, you're going to get yourself killed, son. Because he ended up working for the, the PCA, and uh, the policeman didn't like him because he was a policeman's policeman. And the public didn't like him because he was a policeman, full stop. And uh, after four years, he said to me, you know what, Dad? I'm resigning. Because he'd seen too much from the inside, and he knew that there was times when, because he was there, another person of colour didn't get a kick in. You know, and these are the kind of experiences that we had to live with. I mean, I remember um, a boy at school saying to me, what's number one in the jungle? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, congratulations. <laughs> Well, um, he yeah, woke up sometime yeah. later. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I stuck one or two on him. <laughs> right? And uh, another time when someone said to me, how do you know when your hands are clean? And so I said, the same way you're going to know tomorrow morning when you wake up that you've got a black eye. <laughs> um, Thank you. Can, can I just say something? Um, I just wanted to say that um, this old exhibition they have here at the British Library, that um, I, I want to pay tribute to Kevin Legendre. Is that his name? Yeah. yeah. Kevin Legendre, who wrote a book. And I haven't seen, any, I haven't seen it in the exhibition, but he wrote a book called Don't Stop the Carnival. Mm -hmm. British black music from the Middle Ages mm -hmm. to the 1960s. Mm -hmm. A brilliant book, meticulously researched, an important piece of scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, um, Michael Riley, Michael Riley, um, and his colleagues at Westminster University. It seems to me have taken it from where um, Kevin's book ended and brought it forward with this huge project called Base Culture. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot to thank those two guys for. Thank you. Yeah. Perhaps you'd like to have the last word because we've got to end in a moment. So would you, can we have a mic down here, please? Thank you. Um, well, I, I didn't know if you'd the last question and you, you guys are all brilliant. Um, um, but like I, I, I wondered if uh, you guys um, thought that like, um, like how do you think like the nature of um, whether you call it racism or discrimination um, um, has like changed like to now um, because like like now you you, you probably still get the racist policemen, um, like, they say it's less, but um, we know it still does happen. But, like, do you think it's more academic or do you think it's more, like, people saying, oh, you can't say this, you can't say that, and we're thinking, well, it's not just about that, it's more than that? Or what do you think and how, how do you think music can express... Um, I don't know. Um, music is a great level. It brings people together. Um, and 
especially during the punk era, there was solidarity in music between punk and reggae, between black and white unemployed youth um, who um, had, this, had similar experiences. But racism is in the cultural DNA of this country. Um, and it will never be completely uh, eradicated and, uh, and eliminated. But we've changed um, w through our political organization by organizing ourselves, um, by agitating, um, through, through um, the insurrections and uprisings that we had during the 80s, through demonstrations of black political power um, as in 1981 with the Black People's Day of Action when we mobilized 20,000 people in response to the New Cross massacre. Um, through those actions, we've helped to break down what was known in my time as the color bar, broke down the barriers to racial integration. There used to be this myth among some, even among sociologists that, you know, these people uh, from the Caribbean, these black people, um, you know, found it difficult to adjust to the British way of life. It's just a lot of nonsense because we were created by the British in the first place. Um, but through our struggles, we've been able to, to change England, break down a lot of barriers to integration, so that in the 21st century, we've reached a stage now where, you know, you've got black reactionary politicians, um, right-wing black politicians in government, in parliament, you know, who, you know, who um, um, want to sound more anti-immigrant than their white counterparts, and, and, and so on. Uh, but there's been changes, and um, we need to acknowledge that there have been changes, and the, those changes weren't handed on a plate to us. We had to fight for them. Well, I think that's an excellent note on which to end. Thank you all very much for being Good. so generous and so attentive to each other and to the questions. And so perhaps everybody would like to uh, join me in thanking the panelists this evening. Thank you.